Welcome to Celebrating Act Two, where today John and I get to speak with Manny Pacheco. And if it was ever in Hollywood and everybody forgot it, Manny will have remembered. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody does forget about for, forgotten Hollywood Manny's books, the great mm. books. Hey, Manny, uh, speaking about being Mr. Hollywood, uh, you really do attend a lot of events. How was TCM this year? It was a blast. Uh, I had a chance to go to a couple of uh, events. One of the events I, I, I was able to attend was the um, press junket where you get to hang out with the hosts. So I had yeah. a chance to you know revisit with Eddie Muller and actually had a chance to speak with Jacqueline Stewart and Dave Carter. Yeah. And uh, and then I went to the fan club party that they had at the Hollywood Heritage. About 250 people were there. And oh, it's, it's from the uh, fans of the T of going to the TCM Festival fan club that uh, that's on Facebook. And they have really grown by leaps and bounds. And it was just a lot of fun hanging out with everybody. People were uh, buying books by the droves. And I got a chance to chat, you know, Hollywood. And it was fun. And then I had a chance to actually watch a movie. We had great movies there. Um, you know, movies like um, All About Eve and The Music Man and yeah. Casablanca. So what did I go see? Airport. <laughs> with, with Burt Lancaster and Dean Martin, one of the really great Warner Brothers pictures. And and uh, the last movie ever scored by the great Alfred Newman. So it, it was a fun movie to watch. Definitely a popcorn movie. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And sure. so... Uh, but what they were there for is that they were celebrating Warner Brothers' 100th anniversary. And in fact, all month, Turner Classic Movies is celebrating their 100th anniversary. Yeah. And all of their platforms that Warner Brothers belongs to now, that their associations, also celebrating uh, with them their uh, centennial. So um, I thought it'd be a good thing for us to look at Warner Brothers, one of the five big studios from, from that era, that included Universal and MGM and 20th Century Fox and Paramount Pictures. Warner's was the was that other um, movie studio that was just huge and dynamic, and they made a real statement during the studio era. Yeah, yeah they they all kind of had their own um, thing, didn't they? I mean, they were known for MGM that had the musicals and yada yada yada. Universal uh, what, the monster. What was Warner Brothers. What was Warner Brothers' signature, if you will? Well, they were really on the uh, the cusp of, of dealing with social commentary. We had just come out of a depression. So they started picking uh, movies. Uh, they started with escapism, you know, the Bus Busby Berkeley musicals. You know, the this was during pre-code, right before they were going to be, um, uh, the Hayes Code was going to come in. And so they, they, would, they did the stuff like 42nd Street, and they did the Gold Diggers of 1933 and, and the like. But what they really, really settled into was uh, making sure that we had an unadulterated look at gangsters. And they were known for their gangster films. And it began with Little uh, Caesar. Oh, yeah. With, with Edward G. Robinson. And then okay. right with, into William Wellman's The Public Enemy that made James Cagney a star. Yes. And, and so, and then, of course, but they had others. I mean, George Rapp, Paul Muni was real big into the gangsters before he started doing the biopics. You know, the fugitive from the chain gang. I mean, he did that kind of Scarface. Yeah. So I mean, they really wanted to look at what was on the front pages of newspapers. And really, during that time, it was Dillinger and Bonnie and Clyde and Babyface Nelson yeah. and Machine Gun Kelly. You know, they were all these these gangsters and they didn't necessarily want to glorify them, but they really wanted to bring to light the problems that society was facing. And it made stars of James Cagney and Edward G. Robinson, Paul Muni, uh, and then George Raft, and then later Humphrey Bogart and John Garfield. And so really, really, um, really wonderful, iconic movies. And, and the gangster uh, films then transitioned later to the film noir films, beginning with The Maltese Falcon and oh, the, big, yeah. the Big Sleep and all those. And in between... They were also becoming really well known for their adventure flicks, you know, the Captain Bloods and the Adventures of Robin Hood. And of course, you know who the star was then. That was uh, Errol Flynn well, and bet. Olivia de Havilland. So they had really strong, stable yeah. stars. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, what, what uh, um, uh, Warner Brothers with MGM and the, the others that you mentioned, uh, for, for better or worse, they were 
part of the uh, studio system, the Hollywood system, where they basically put people into contract and could essentially buy and sell, make or break, tell who to marry, who to date, and so on and so forth. So uh, in that era, what are some of uh, there some uh, uh, interesting stories about some major stars that they either had a rift with or or something? Right. That's a great question, actually, Art. I have to tell you. I, it, first of all, we should say there were five Warner Brothers. One died mm -hmm. uh, right at the pr literally the days before the premiere of the Jazz Singer, we, wow. and Warner Brothers became known as the first studio to present talking pictures. And then Sam Warner up and dies, mm -hmm. and, and the youngest brother Jack and Harry, his his oldest brother basically ran operations until finally Jack ran Harry right off the studio. But Jack Warner's who, who we're dealing with, and that question refers directly to Jack. And he was a tough taskmaster, always had the idea that if you did not take an assignment, that he would take the time that would have taken for that assignment, put it at the end of your contract, and then you were basically enslaved to the, uh, to the movie studio. Wow. And there were several actors that were really against that. And one of them was maybe their greatest. I mean, for, you can speak about James Cagney and Errol Flynn and Bogart all you want, but maybe their greatest property was Betty Davis. Mm. And Betty Davis did not like her contract. Yep. And, and Olivia de Havilland did not like her contract. And they were they were battling Jack Warner for better films because they were turning down pedestrian, you know, productions. Sure. And so so the, they were really, uh, really on the cusp of, of, of making sure that eventually uh, actors would have their own say. And Olivia de Havilland actually had a, a, a de, the, the de Havilland case in which she it was ruled in court that she was allowed to really decide the, her, the future of her career in, in terms of, of the quality of the movies that were being made. Right. So that, that, I mean, know, that's, that's one of the big stories that, that came out of that era. You know, I, um, I, I still recall a Betty Davis interview with Dick Cavett years ago, and I'm sure you could find it on Google. I, I've seen it, and, yeah. And he asked her about the studio system being essentially a slave. And she said, you know, we would have never ever tried to buck the system if Jack Warner had just once come to us and said, great job on your last film, Bet. <laughs> just once, <laughs> you know, but he never did. He was a tough guy and yeah, so, you know, and it's easy to attack. I mean, we could spend the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever, attacking Jack Warner. But there was a couple of things that he did really, really well. Along with Carl Lemley over at Universal, Jack Warner was really big in calling attention to the fact that there was fascism very running rampant in Europe. I mean, it was very, very prevalent. And it was happening in Spain. It was happening in Italy. And he particularly hated what was happening Um to to the poles and the and the, and all of the jewish the, the the german jews and and the and the um, the the gypsies and 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 enslaving them in the in these ghettos and then into camps and and he wanted to call the light and he he went head to head with the hayes office because the hayes uh, group had a really strict uh rule that we were not to attack leaders of other countries for because they they, they knew the power of movies and that movies might, you know, cause some sort of a political fracas between the Roosevelt administration and and any uh, any uh, head of state. But I mean, we were talking about Hitler, and and Jack Warner knew exactly what he was doing. But here's the dirty little secret that I I uncovered recently, is that one of the folks that was really strong in making sure that the Hayes Code was enforced for that rule, Goebbels. No, in Germany, really? yes, Joseph Goebbels was in conversations with the Hayes Co with the Hayes people, um, um, and the, and they were very clear: don't attack our administrations, oh, wow. keep them out of films, and 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 you know the other studios acquiesced, but Jack Warner, nope. So you end up with with movies like Confessions of a Nazi Spy, yeah, and Black Legion with Bogart. And these were really great films that tackled uh, fascist infiltration in the United States. He's the one that called attention to that. And, and, and in many respects, Jack Warner can, can be considered a hero for that. Yeah, I think um, a part of um, uh, what I remember about reading uh, about the Warner Brothers is they were all refugees 
from Europe. And they came here and they, they just happened to wind up settling uh, into the, the movie business. Uh, but they were definitely refugees and uh, they, they saw everything that was happening and uh, uh, they were taking quarter from anybody. As, as, as a group of just as a family. And, and the other thing to consider, too, they moved from the East Coast to the West Coast, cause like every other movie mogul of that era, they were trying to get away from having to pay patents to Thomas Edison. So that's huh. that's why Hollywood was created. Otherwise, it would have it would have stayed in the East Coast. Wait, that and the weather. Let's the put weather that down. I don't think we've actually discussed that. So let's put that for a whole episode. OK, yeah. that's okay. Fine. That's a great story, actually. Good. Anyway, Any happy 100th anniversary to Warner Brothers. Yes, let's say a happy anniversary to Warner Brothers, and let's uh, offer a toast that they have another hundred more. I know that art is very um, curious as to what's going to happen to the future, but you know, like every other major uh, entertainment corporation, they're diversifying. You're going to find them in in streaming services, and you're just you're just going to see them exist and keep up with the times because they just can. And so. Um, it's great to reminisce about the great films they made, and they made a number of great films. I, I they they I mean, literally hundreds of great films. Uh, even later on, you know, Rebel Without a Cause, and uh, um, they they did the, uh, the the Woodward and Bernstein, All the President's Men. Wow. I mean, they did so many great films, even into the seventies, and 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 Jack Warner, uh, you know, ran ran the uh, the operation into the late sixties. So I mean. It, it's a great company that still diversifies. The only negative thing that I will say is that they are starting to destroy some of their um, location. You know, they you go on the lot and you got these mm. wonderful um, sets that they have, and they're getting rid of them to create new and bigger sets. But I think some of those sets need to be preserved because, I mean, that's history to me. I think that that's something that can go into a museum. Yeah, or or any other uh, place where people can actually go in and enjoy looking at a familiar place. When you walk down that street where where um, J uh, James Cagney's partner is gunned down, I I've been on that tour and I've seen exactly the place where he was gunned down, and it it brings chills to me to say I that was in a film. I can't believe I'm right here now. <laughs> and, and if you live out of state and you visit, can you imagine the excitement that is for yeah. the average? film goer from across the country it's, it's it's warner brothers is a very magical place and i'm really happy that they've made it to 100. great well thank you manny and thank you for more on celebrating act two visit our webpage follow us on facebook subscribe to us on youtube and tell your friends celebrating act two is the user manual for the second half of your life